covered the Owen Patterson story a week ago, thinking, well, Tory Slees, that'll be the high marker for that story. The media will bury it as per usual. But it has rumbled on and on, in large part due to Johnson staunchly refusing to apologise for any of it, apparently believing it is a sign of weakness to do so. Oliver Dowden, the Tory party chairman, and the answer to the question, what happens if we put Bertie Wooster in charge, had the gall to say on the morning's media today that he didn't have time to apologise as he was too busy securing the future for our children and our grandchildren. Oh, don't make me sick. Get your head out of his arse for two seconds and wake up, Bertie. Peston and Coonsberg are complaining about a lack of space. What future after the failure of COP26? What future after years of being pushed into poverty? Oh, silly me. You just meant your own kids and grandkids, didn't you? It's no doubt news to him, but the opposite is true, Bozo. It takes balls to face the music and you haven't got any. You ran away, hid in your proverbial fridge again, and instead of killing the scandal off, you fed the fires even more as every day a new sleaze story emerges. Right-wing papers are now coming out to slam you and that seemingly unassailable Tory poll lead, despite the COVID disaster that should have killed it off, has now slipped, with one poll now giving Labour a six-point lead, almost certainly an outlier, but other polls have trended in the same direction. Starmer's tactic of standing for sweet FA and waiting for Johnson to destroy himself seems to be paying off at last. But when he's apparently sought second jobs as well, or at least would have liked to have been if he hadn't been stopped, if sleaze is what finally turns the public against Johnson, what chance does it have of changing under a Labour Party, also led by right-wingers, also on the take? <music> Boris Johnson is a man for whom sleaze might as well be his middle name. To be referred to directly as sleaze instead of Boris has a much more honest feel about it. From his serial examples of infidelity, sleeping around behind his wife's back as she was battling cancer, the ongoing saga surrounding Jennifer R. Curie rumbling on, then marrying one of Owen Patterson's former staffers. He is the Prime Minister who seems permanently to have his trousers around his ankles. Then there are the numerous holidays that he doesn't seem to pay for. The wallpaper incident that also turned into a financial scandal. Even on the election trail, hiding in fridges and snatching phones from journalists couldn't hurt him. And that's before we even mention racism. He gets away with it in the eyes of the public over and over. Even if he has been sacked for lying when his party actually had some standards and even sacked as a journalist for literally making shit up. Every time it becomes a story of, oh, Boris, and he moves on up. The man who is his own worst enemy, yet he keeps falling upwards to ever greater jobs, now ridiculously leading the country, but only leading it to become a global laughingstock. We're getting laughed at for electing him. We're getting laughed at for polling that shows we choose him again, despite abuse of power, despite inflicting more pain and poverty, and despite some of the worst mishandling of the COVID pandemic anywhere in the world. Finally, though, perhaps his time is coming to a close. If there's one thing that seems to have finally pissed off the collective British psyche, it's being on the take. We've all felt the pain of having our incomes drop, everything becoming more expensive, being told it's necessary for the common good for over a decade now. Yet they've been helping themselves to second helpings, whilst for many it's a choice each week between heating and eating. The list of examples amongst the Conservatives is seemingly endless. The COVID crisis handling is itself mired in sleaze, mainly centred around the then Health Secretary Matt Hancock, who sought to enrich mates with positions of power and crony contracts. His constituency is home to Cheltenham Racecourse and the Jockey Club. So his mate, Dido Harding, got the gig to oversee Test and Trace. Let's never forget that. But less well known is the fact she's married to another Tory MP herself, John Penrose, who hilariously also happens to be the Tory's anti-corruption czar. Hancock now wants to write a book, apparently, portraying himself as some kind of superhero who defeated COVID. Yet with over 150,000 people having died under his tenure, his is a track record of abject failure that must not be whitewashed. And I hope HarperCollins, who have denied any such book offer, are true to their word. Then there's Owen Patterson, of course, who sparked off this examination of second jobs and brought into question if MPs are really working for us or wealthy lobbyists. Patterson was found to be favouring the latter, but thought he could just deny it and his Tory mates would see him right. As it happens, the public outcry was significant enough to tarnish the reputation of every single one of the 242 Tory MPs who voted to let Patterson off for his abuse of power. 
they've now held their hands up saying sorry that it was an error but without that outcry it wouldn't have happened patterson would be home and dry instead of finding himself out in the cold sadly there are many more examples grant shapps the transport minister who happens to have a pilot's license has created a scheme where private pilots can charge the taxpayer for half of their equipment and has spent millions more publishing public cash lobbying against building on runways particularly the one he happens to use for his own aircraft minister for transport minister for private jets would be more like it jonathan janogli you might not have heard of the chap but he's a conservative mp and chair of a venture capitalist trust where he gets thirty thousand pounds a year for just 32 hours work damien green mr porn on the laptop gets forty thousand pounds a year advising a private rail and bus operator so no votes for renationalization there Chris Grayling, old failing Grayling, remember him? He rakes in more than £100,000 a year from Hutchison Ports Europe, which is itself hilarious when you remember he is the man who awarded ferry contracts to a company that didn't have any. Jacob Rees-Mogg, the haunted pencil and minister for Dickensian attitudes, failed to declare £6 million he'd lent himself in direct loans from his Cayman Island-based company as part of a tax dodge, because taxes are for the likes of us, apparently, and not for arrogant toffs like him. Nadim Zahawi, the education minister, took £1.3 million from oil company Gulf Keystone. And you wonder why COP26 was such a failure with ministers in the pockets of the fossil fuel industry. Natalie Elphick, who basically inherited her convicted sex offender husband Charlie Elphick's Tory seat after he got sent down, then sold her story to Murdoch's scumrag for £25,000 and rakes in a further £36,000 a year advising a watchdog for new build housing. This is the same person who told Marcus Rashford to stick to the day job when he campaigned to feed kids she'd rather have seen go hungry. The register of interest really should be a place we all spend a bit more time, where we should all start looking into what our MPs are up to. 16 MPs have put their housing costs on expenses whilst renting out property they themselves own. A total of £1.3 million between them. Amongst them, probably the most infamous second jobber going right now, Jeffrey Cox, the walking foghorn, who could be heard from as far away as the Caribbean, where he was working for a law firm whilst Parliament was sitting, voting remotely instead of being where he should have been, in Parliament or in his constituency, representing the people who elected him. No wonder missing posters have been popping up across Torridge and West Devon, asking if anyone has seen him. He's raked in roughly a million pounds on the side. But when he and others like him are pulling in more cash than their parliamentary wage of nearly 82,000 pounds, it's a generous wage. The job they are elected to do is neither full time nor even their first priority. The Tories aren't alone in this, though. And that's the most troubling aspect of all of this, because if everyone is at it, nobody will stand up to fix it. Corbyn pledged to do so whilst he was still Labour leader. Just one more reason to bring him down if you look at some of the shits who stabbed him in the back. Let's start with Starmer, working for Mishkondorea before he entered Parliament and as a backbencher, offering legal advice. He had to give it up as a frontbencher as per Corbyn's instruction when he became Shadow Brexit Secretary. But he still tried to get his way and worked for them anyway, requesting Corbyn reconsider, try and convince him to change his mind, but to no avail. And rightly so. We don't elect people to represent us some of the time. We elect them to represent us all of the time. And if £82,000 a year isn't enough for you, fuck off and let someone less greedy take over. But he's not alone. Geraint Davis and Clive Betts are two of those 16 landlord MPs. They weren't all Tories. David Lammy presents a radio show and charges for regular public service speaking appear appearances. Margaret Hodge, we know, has lucrative business interests, but still, she does take £20,000 a year on top of all of that, as chair of Royal Holloway's College Council, earned for just three hours work a week. The Lib Dems are no better either. Vera Hobhouse is another landlord. Ed Davies, who leads what's left of them, breaks in £78,000 a year in consultancy fees, which he claims goes to his disabled child. Can I have £78,000 too for mine? I'll call it a consultancy as well, shall I, in how to teach MPs not to be such inward-looking, advantage-taking, money-grubbing, self-serving, greed-driven bastards. <sighs> An important additional point here, though, is that many of these MPs have companies of their own or have directorships in, and any business interests there won't appear in the public register of interest. People like Jacob Rees-Mogg, like Nadim Zahawi, like Margaret Hodge is 
business interests, as I mentioned a moment ago. They can have additional ventures providing additional income because such dealings might be in a company name. They wouldn't appear in an MP's public register of interest, yet this still can and does influence how they choose to vote. This is a massive loophole in declaring vested interests and absolutely has to be closed. Now, when I did my last vid on Starmer and Mishkondorea, when I went into that in detail, I came in for some criticism there because the scale of corruption is different. The people bringing this up or thinking of it, I'll say for one, that isn't the point. If it's morally and ethically wrong, the scale shouldn't matter. And for two, the Tories are in government and therefore the target of a great deal more lobbying, a great deal more temptation, and they're taking it. We think Labour wouldn't do likewise under this leadership, given what has come out about Starmer particularly of late, then I have a bridge to sell you. Look at some former Labour grandees and their net worths these days. They didn't get that on an MP's salary. Starmer has finally pulled in front of the Tories in a few polls. It seems his time is finally coming, especially with the papers piling in on Johnson. But let's get something straight here. Standing for nothing is not a winning strategy. You've got a Boris bounce because he's finding himself increasingly unpopular and out of his debt. This polished turd of a PM is no longer shiny in more people's eyes. At some point, and I don't think it'll be too long the way things are going, the Tories will replace him, and it's what they do. And frankly, it wouldn't take much to put them in front when Labour continues to staunchly stand for nothing. The Tories will replace Johnson, ruthless as they are, when he becomes too much of a liability. They can then move on from the Covid fuck-up and Brexit, as they'll just saddle him with the blame. It'll be what he's remembered for. And for those and the media, as per usual, will help them do that. Starmer can't win an election standing for nothing as he relentlessly does. A new Tory PM before the next election will return their lead. If as many lamestream commentators predict that becomes Rishi Sunak, it'll throw even more shade on Starmer as they appoint the first non-white British Prime Minister. The Starmer seems fixated on purging his party of MPs of the same persuasion. The problem for us as a country is that either of these part, either one of these parties will be the ones in power. So if you're worried about what to buy granny for Christmas, ask the Tories and Labour to produce a price list and see which MPs are ready wrapped and sleeves compliant as neither party right now will do a damn thing to stop this.